second Samuel chapter 5 and verse 1 until verse 5 then all the tribes of Israel came to David saying indeed we are your bone and your flesh also in the time past when Saul was a king over us you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in the Lord said to you you shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel therefore all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord and they anointed David king over Israel David was 30 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 40 years in Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years and six months and in Jerusalem reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah somebody say amen we have a lot of people who are very anointed very known and thorough in the scripture and I'm not going to just try to preach some kind of a uh, thing to make you uh, feel confused or say it's very deep I just want to share something very practical that will launch us into the sessions that we will have in just about 40 or 35 minutes or so as a local church we've been in a series that we've called it host the Holy Ghost meaning to host the Holy Spirit in our life and this morning I want to talk about how to activate the activity of the Holy Spirit in our lives somebody say with me activate the activity of the Holy Spirit in my life turn to your neighbor say activate the activity of the Holy Spirit in your life turn to your other neighbor say get activated in Jesus name anointing of the Holy Spirit is one of the most important things that we need as Christians anointing of the Holy Spirit is what breaks the yoke anointing of the Holy Spirit is what heals the sick anointing of the Holy Spirit is what draws lost people to salvation anointing of the Holy Spirit is what draws young people to church what draws young people to church is not coffee and smoke machines on the stage what draws young people to church is not ripped jeans or earrings in their ears. What draws young people, contrary to popular opinion, is not clapping or dancing. It's the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Anointing is not hype. Anointing is not volume. Anointing is not lights. Anointing is not smoke machine. Anointing is not ripped jeans. Anointing is not even shaking and baking. It's the power that produces change in people's lives. anointing is one of the things that the devil will fight and attack in the last days more than anything else satan is gonna be the antichrist anti-christ meaning he will go anti-anointing he's not gonna be anti-jesus he's not gonna be anti-savior he's going to be anti-anointing that means satan hates anointing because anointing is the only thing that can cripple his kingdom he's not afraid of good sermons he's not afraid of fabulous music he's not afraid of our facilities he's not afraid of the eloquence of our speech he's not afraid of our professional organizational skills he's not afraid of the gift of administration none of those things can cripple his kingdom like one drop of God's anointing and therefore devil will do whatever it takes to entice Christians first to hate anointing despise anointing to not embrace anointing to get offended at the anointing to trip over the anointing and to completely wash their hands off and say I don't want to do anything that has to do with the power of the Holy Spirit in the church today I don't understand it I don't like it it makes me uncomfortable it's crazy because it goes outside of my box of thinking I didn't grow up seeing this I didn't grow up embracing this the way I grew up we didn't do that and the devil will do whatever it takes to put you against the anointing because the anointing 
goes against him. What we need as church is more of the anointing. What you need as a Christian is more of the anointing. Healing is great but anointing is better because anointing produces healings. See getting an apple is good, having an apple tree is better. Getting delivered is great but getting relationship with Holy Spirit is so much better because He produces freedom, He produces healing, He produces salvation and He produces change in our life. If you agree, say Amen. Amen. David was the man that God anointed at a very young age. When he was very young, a prophet named Samuel came to David and he anointed him to be a king. David was not old enough to be a king. David wasn't ready to be a king. David didn't have the education to be a king. David had no connections to be a king. David's dad wasn't a king. Nobody in his family was a king. And the prophet at the very young age comes to David and says, you are a king. I want to encourage every person who doesn't consider themselves young today. Don't believe in young generation when you see signs of potential. It's too late. You gotta believe and speak into teenagers to see signs of change. You gotta develop a Samuel anointing, a Samuel's gift and Samuel's gift is he sees a teenager, he doesn't see a kid, he sees a king. We have today older people who don't see a king, who see a kid in a kid. It doesn't take Holy Spirit to see a kid in a kid. It takes the Holy Spirit to see a king inside of the kid. And it doesn't take the Holy Spirit to see a king inside of the king. People come up to me today and they say, Vlad, I listen to your messages. You're so anointed. I know that. Where were you when I was 14? When my prayer was, God, kill me in a car accident because I know I have no purpose in this life. And my pastor did not wait until I preached my sermon good. He starts speaking into me that there is a king inside of this confused, insecure kid. And he started to speak into me before I even believed it. And those words produced something. The Holy Spirit, because I believed in those words, start producing change inside of my heart. Many pastors today are threatened by young generation. Some pastors today, they see young generation as a threat like Saul did with David. When he saw David rising up, he saw him as a threat to his kingdom so he wanted to kill them. Churches today fight against young people because they see young people as a threat. If we give them too much freedom, they'll act this and they'll act that. Young people are not a threat. You're just insecure. Come on church, help me out. Amen. There's the rest of us. That is the rest of us, we don't see young people as a threat, but we see young people as victims. Israel, when they were walking to promised land, they looked at their children and they saw them as victims. They said this to God and God repeated back to them in numbers. He said, and the children that you call victims will possess the promised land. God was saying, Sometimes we get so negative as parents that we are barely winning any breakthrough in our own life. We look at our poor children and we're like, if I cannot break through, it's ne they'll never break through. But you have to understand, 
Never see next generation through the lenses of your history and your experience, but through the lenses of God's promise and God's plan for this earth. If you are a young person, you should be clapping right now because that means God has a plan for your life. Come on, somebody. Young generation are not victims. Young generation are part of God's plan in the last days. There is also a category of people who don't see them as victims or don't see them as threat. They simply curse the next generation by calling next generation by their current situation, by their current problem. It's kind of like Rachel did when she was in pain of child labor and a baby popped up but it cost her so much pain and she looked at that little child and she, she said, you are a son of my sorrow. It's kind of like what the other people did when Jacob was born and said, you're a supplanter. It's what Elisha did when his servant made a mistake and he says, let leprosy of name and come upon you. Never curse somebody because you're hurting, because you're struggling. My Lord Jesus Christ saw his disciples hurting and suffering and making a lot of mistakes but you never once see Jesus bringing the leprosy of the sick people and his disciples because they made a mistake. Even on Judas, Jesus didn't even curse Judas. He still called him a friend even though Judas was acting like a devil. When your kid is acting out and he's an alcoholic, never call him an alcoholic. Call him a preacher with a great testimony. When your child doesn't want to come to church, call him a missionary. Simply say, God will use you. You're going to be great in God's kingdom. It irritates them. You want to really make them mad? Look at them prophetically, not pathetically. Don't look at them through the lens of the reality. Look at the next generation and begin to say, I see greatness in you. I know God's going to use you. In these last days, God is a little bit short on people. And so I signed you up on God's plan. You got no choice. I'm your mama. I brought you into this world. And I signed you up with God's kingdom. Period. Come on, somebody. Samuel makes David a king when David is not even ready to get a license. Samuel calls him a king when he's not ready to even get married. I love this about God. He starts very early. You see these teenagers. We have pastors here today. We have bishops here today. We have pastors from different countries in this room. Do you know why every service we have teenagers represented on the stage? Because if the world gives them license at 16, at 15, they better be speaking in tongues, healing the sick, casting out devils, leading people to Christ and already know how to pray, how to preach and how to lead other teenagers in their school to God. If at 11 they get introduced to weed, that means at 12 they gotta be introduced to Christ. If at 14, it's an average age when a teenage girl loses her virginity. This is where at 13, they have to lose their pride to God and lose their arrogance and lust at the altar and give their life to God. If Mormons make their teenagers missionaries before they go to universities, that's why we have internship that before you go to your university, give one year to God. You're still going to spend that year in your university studying for a degree you are most likely will not use. Because you will change your majors three times. Prophetic word by the way for you. So instead of changing your major four times and having your parents pay for your confusing trying to discover God's will for my life, pause, give that one year to God. Join an internship. Whether it's at our church or somebody's church. And then make a difference for God before you go trying to make a living in this world. Are you with me church? And so I see that Samuel anoints David at a very young age. David had a calling on his life and his calling was to deliver the people of Israel from their enemies. 
God never called people in the Old Testament to make them rich, famous or because they were great. God only was calling people because there was an assignment on their life to bring His people out of certain trouble that they were in. When God calls a man or a woman, it's not because He deserves to be called. It's not because He now lives so righteous that God gives Him an award. When God calls somebody, it's usually a response to a cry of someone else that God has been hearing. As you're sitting here right now and I am speaking with you, in our church there's a voice message that's currently completely full. People are calling our church number and leaving their voice message there. Now the interesting part is you and I don't actually hear those voice messages. The only person who knows that somebody's leaving a voice message is somebody who's at the office right now. I want to tell you something that in our city and in our generation, people are crying out to God every single day. Single moms who cannot pay their bills, people who get heartbroken as we saw the testimonies and people who are demon possessed, people who are suffering under the burden of homosexuality, lesbianism, people who cannot figure out their gender today, people who are today maybe are rejected, maybe molested, maybe those who are being raped, maybe those who got introduced to drugs before they go to sleep and you all have done it, so am I. When we didn't serve God, we say, God help me. And God hears those prayers. He collects those prayers in the cup. And when the cup runs over in each city, God picks up a phone and dials a person in that city and says, I'm calling you to ministry. Now you think God's calling you because you're special. You think God's calling you because He hates you, maybe. He's like, Lord, I wanted to be a businessman and you're calling me into ministry. Lord, what have I done? You think God is calling you to be a missionary or God is calling you to preach? It's because maybe God wants to just anoint you. You don't realize the only reason God's calling you is because He's answering somebody's cry. He's answering somebody's cry. When at the age of 16, when I felt the call of God on my life, I never thought until now that I meet people who get impacted by my ministry. I never thought that God knew all of that and He wasn't calling me for any other reason except for this. He knew the cries of people that my life supposed to impact. And God was trying to be fair with those people by answering their cry if I would answer the call. Do you know why healings don't happen? Deliverances don't happen? Do you know why people go to hell? because we don't pick up the phone. For every lost person in the world, God makes a phone call. Many of us, we have our phone on silent. Or some of us, we like the feeling of conviction, but we love the snooze button too much. We love getting convicted. Oh, it feels so good. I'm so bad, but it feels so good. We as Pentecostals especially, we love being, feeling bad about ourselves. Coming to the altar, oh man it hurts, but it feels so good. I know I will do nothing absolutely with this, but it still feels good. Snooze, 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 snooze. And then we say, why is God letting people go to hell? Why do you let him go to hell? God gave his son. What are you giving for that? I had a person one time on Facebook wrote to me and he says, I can't believe in God because if He's so loving, why is He letting people go to hell who don't never heard of Him? I said, actually it's not God's fault, it's yours. I said, get off of your Facebook and go start preaching to people. If you really want people saved, don't talk about it, go talk to them. God has done everything God can do so everybody can be saved. Now what He does is He calls us to be a solution and to be an answer to this world. But what most of us are doing is we're fighting in the church and what style of music we're going to have, what style of clothing we're going to have, and what color of carpet are we going to have instead of people who are going to hell. I don't like English language. It's not about you. But I want my name. I want to preserve the culture. 
I'm in America. I need to preserve my culture in the church. Well, I hope you will be really good and confident when you meet Jesus Christ, whose eyes are burning with fire, and your accomplishment on this earth was, I preserved the culture. He says, I died to save the world and you lived to preserve your culture, which means nothing now in eternity. It will be embarrassing. We need to live for the cause of seeing people come to Jesus. Are you with me? When we live with that calling, God gives us anointing on that calling. Say this with me. Say, I am anointed and I am appointed. Turn to your neighbor say, you're appointed. To win souls and make disciples. Turn to the other neighbor say, because you're appointed, you're already anointed. Come on, if you believe in that, give God a shout of praise right now. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. But being anointed does not mean that that anointing is functional in our life. A lot of times what happens is that for those of you who maybe got a new phone or you got a debit card in the mail or a credit card you have found this to be true that a credit card or debit card arrives to you and they have this thing a sticker on it that it cannot be used until it gets what's the word so everything is there it's your card it has your name on it it's connected to your account everything is there it's just if you go to atm or you go anywhere it will not work because it's not been what Come on, say I'll communicate. Activated. So I want to share with you right now three things that activate the anointing of the Holy Spirit or the power of the Holy Spirit. The first one is desperation. Somebody say desperation. Come on, say desperation. A lot of times when you discover you are called by God and you start to get desperate for God like never before, something activates inside of you. You become so hungry for God that you begin to notice that it's not just you speaking now it's not just you ministering right now it is the Holy Spirit moving through you are you with me number two it's not only desperation somebody say association say association so not only you are desperate but you have to also associate yourself with certain kind of people uh, you know we know that the uh, quote that says the birds of feather they fly together the bible says that uh, uh, that people who walk together with the wise they'll become wise when you connect yourself many times with people who are anointed it rubs off on you right same thing is the opposite if you always hang out with people who curse f-bombs will slip out of your mouth if you surround yourself with people who are poor, you will be like that. If you surround yourself with people who are walking with God, seeing people saved, seeing people delivered, it will quickly begin to rub off on you. That's one of the reasons I don't listen to anything I want to listen to on YouTube or on my phone. I don't even listen to all the preachers I want to listen to. Because I want to have exactly in my ministry and in my life what I listen to. Because through listening to someone, reading a book, watching somebody's videos, it's an act of impartation into your life. So you receive activation through association. And the third thing is impartation. So the way we get activated is when we get desperate, when we surround ourselves with people who walk with God. And number three, when we get impartation. Now for David, it was the third one. Samuel came, he took a jar of oil and he poured on David's head and when the oil touched him and Samuel prayed for him and pronounced the blessings, the Spirit of God came upon David at that moment. And because David was careful enough to continue to surround himself with anointed people like Samuel, Nathan, Prophet and others. And because David was careful enough to continue being hungry for God, that anointing grew with him. It didn't die. Now I want to point out something that's very important and it's been a painful experience for me when I was younger. David received impartation without physical manifestation. David did not shake, did not fall, did not speak in tongues 
and didn't prophesy. Nothing happened on the outside. A lot of times, Apostle John Chi, whoever the pastor that you look up to, people come up to them and they say, pray for me so that I will walk in the same grace that you walk in. Or, like tomorrow is going to happen, where Apostle is going to pray for everyone. And many of us will experience absolutely nothing. David had exactly the same experience. Samuel prayed for him. No shaking, no vibrating, no falling, no speaking in tongues, no prophesying, nothing. This is what I found out. When you receive impartation and nothing, your body doesn't react. You're still anointed if your mind reacts. King Saul was anointed and there was reaction. He started to prophesy. He went, he saw the prophets and he started to say, thus says the Lord. One time when there was anointing, King Saul vibrated on the floor and shook all night. But one thing about King Saul is that nothing in his mind ever changed. He didn't go from son of Kish to become an anointed man. His body reacted better than his mind and therefore on his inauguration Saul was hiding behind bags. David never experienced any physical but mentally something shifted in David. When Samuel prayed for him he says that's it God is with me the spirit is with me and when a lion comes David doesn't run David runs at the lion Unlike Saul who hides, he runs at problems. He begins to experience God's supernatural favor in his life. Why? Because real impartation is not when your body reacts. It's when your mind transforms. About five years ago, I was in a very desperate situation in my life where nothing was wrong physically, nothing was wrong financially, nothing was wrong in any other area except one spiritually. I started to notice that we see healings on our conferences but I don't see them personally in my life. We proclaim salvation, salvation, salvation but when the altar call is given nobody's coming to the altar call. We're not baptizing people and our church is very, very small. And I decided to take a desperate, I became very, very desperate where I took all of my money that I had and we gave them away to one particular ministry that sees many people come to know Christ and we asked this ministry to pray for me and my wife so that we can see salvations. I didn't ask for miracles, I just wanted to see salvations and I also wanted to see God's favor in the area of spiritual walk with Him. I met with this particular minister and I asked him to pray for me for the impartation of seeing people coming to know Christ. He took my hands, it was one minute 20 seconds prayer, I have it recorded on my phone. He prayed very calmly and nothing happened. I walked out and I was like, man, I just emptied my whole account. <laughs> At least a shaking baking. That's a heavy price. I'm like, I know some people who shake if the man of God comes like within three miles of them. And my body, I'm like one of those, some of you here, that my body is like Baptist body or something. Like it just doesn't respond to Pentecostal experiences. Like Benny Hinn comes in, everybody falls and I stand. <laughs> anybody I mean unless they, then after a while when I see that he keeps pushing me and I was like you know I'll just go down to help you <laughs> so, so you don't get discouraged I just don't react my body I'm not one of those people who doesn't react and when I left the meeting with this minister of God who prayed for impartation and I had two things to do one of them and I said Lord nothing happened and God says you choose what happened he says do you believe in the prayer that he just prayed he says if you do accept it and begin to see yourself that you're anointed by God to see salvations and to see healing and that's what I did I switched my mind I know people who that minister and many others prayed for who shook on the floor for three days and couldn't stop speaking in tongues and nothing changed in their life I'll rather have no manifestation in my body but a transformation in my mind and change in my life and change in my ministry and shake and bake but there is no results and there is no fruit. The Bible says 
Your life is transformed by the renewing of your mind, not vibration of your body. Some of you can be free the moment you get touched and you know in your heart God set you free. But I didn't shook, but the demon didn't say anything. Praise God. You receive freedom, you stand on that freedom, and you live out of that freedom. The Bible says whom the Son says free is free indeed. But it also says you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Sometimes God sets you free and you shake and bake and we love this stuff. But sometimes God touches you with the sense of knowing. Something changed, something shifted and you walk out with a renewed mind and your life changes. King Saul was vibrating but he never changed his mind. David, well, there was no physical manifestation but his mind shifted and his life was forever transformed. Same thing happens with our team. They see more healings. I think sometimes even people who do healing ministries on a weekly basis, they live normal jobs, have businesses. What happened? Something shifted in their mind. I'm the person God can use. It can happen today. I don't have to have a healing crusade to see God move through me. I don't have to be a pastor to see the Lord use me to influence other people. And as they go about their life, God uses them. Why? Not because impartation happened through shaking. Because impartation happened through revelation that God has anointed me when I got prayed. And that's it. Come on, let's put our hands together for Jesus Christ. I want you to see when David got anointed, David did not apply for being a king. David didn't go searching who's hiring for being a king. And David didn't come to Saul and say, FYI, just letting you know, I'm next in line. You better start training me. When you're anointed, never grab for a platform. Seek for opportunity where you can serve. When you finally figure out that you're special, grab a vacuumer and learn how to vacuum your church. When you finally come out of that low self-esteem, make sure you learn how to put gloves and clean toilets. Because David's anointing did not demand a platform. It's sought for an opportunity where David can serve. Same David who was anointed to kill giants after playing music for Saul and getting rid of the demons from Saul. Saul says, you're free. And David, you know what David did? Went back to be with the sheep. Because there's one thing about anointed people. They have to maintain a small view of themselves. Otherwise, that anointing will kill them. Just because every person you prayed for in the mall got healed, don't grow wings. Remain small in your eyes. Because God came to Saul when Saul started to make mistakes and Samuel said this to Saul from God. He says, when you were small in your eyes, he says, I picked you. But now your head got swollen. Anointed people must also learn never to take offense when opportunities are presented to them that are below their anointing. You asked me to be an usher? Did you know I'm a prophet? I am an apostle. Why am I sitting on the back? Real apostle, real prophet, real pastor is somebody who is just like their savior who one day can give prophecies, walk on water, step down, guard himself and wash somebody's feet. If you cannot pick up a towel, I have an audacity to question, not the anointing, but your crazy character. God is not interested in building superheroes. God is not looking to create Justice League or Avengers League. God is building his kingdom and everyone in his kingdom from the guy who holds the microphone to every person there is first a servant. And I want to tell you something right now. In our church we have this policy. If God really, really, really anointed you, I want to see results on the street and in kids ministry. 
when uh, some of you heard when Ivan got up and spoke and God uses him powerfully in healing a year ago I remember when Ivan just moved from California and he came up and one of the things he wanted to do is to be more involved in church and I said Ivan we go street evangelizing why are you not, not on the streets and I remember he looked at me was like well that's below me if serving is below you leading is above you if you're too small if you're too big I'm sorry for serving then you're too small for leading and I told him I was like Ivan until you are used by God on the streets and secondly until you serve the kids in the kids zone and I hear healings from the kids the stage is no place for people with ambition the stage is a place for people with the heart and the anointing And today when he goes to kids ministry, four salvations, two healings, two baptism of the Holy Spirit. And all the kids love him. Why? And he doesn't preach at the church, he preaches at the streets. When I, before I preached at the church, I preached at homeless shelter and I preached at jails. I stopped going to homeless shelters because we would do fights after the sermon. <laughs> One side would fight another side. It was a great sermon. They loved each other. I ended the sermon and they started a war there, right there. I couldn't pass through because they were all throwing stuff. And I stopped going to jails because they would pat me three times each time because I was 21 and they thought I was bringing drugs to the inmates. Because Russians who are 21 don't go preaching in jail. The only jail ministry led by Russians is usually about 16 and above, not 21 year olds. I preached first at homeless shelter, then in jail, and so I had my two practices, and then on Wednesday night I preached to a crazy youth group. They didn't fight and they didn't pat me, pat me down. But I want to tell you something, if you want to be used by God, if you're anointed, don't look for a platform, look for a place to serve. And sometimes the place of serving is not going to be anything special. God is the only one who knows how to connect the dots when you serve. You may say, but Vlad, if I'm going to go serve, nobody's going to notice me. You don't want people to notice you. You want God to notice you and put you. Because if God puts you, people can put you out. The problem with people, if they put you here, they'll put you down from here. Whoever puts you there has the power to take you down. But if people don't put you there, they can never take you down. Potiphar's wife can took Jason, J Joseph's reputation. She couldn't take his anointing. She ripped everything from him, but she couldn't take his grace and the favor of God upon his life. But when God puts you in there, when God gives you the platform, see David never fought for the platform. There was an opportunity to kill Saul and grab a platform for his anointing. But he says, I trust God to put me in there. And when Absalom wanted to take his platform, David walked off and he says, if God doesn't want me there, I don't want to be there. I want to remain anointed but I don't have to shine. I want, to, I want you to remember this. When you're anointed, don't look for a place to shine. Look for a place to serve. Don't look for a place to shine. Look for a place to serve. I'm bringing this message to an end and we're going to pray right now. The most important thing that I wanted to share with you is this. David got anointed as a teenager to be a king. Only at 30 years of age, he saw a drop of the promise of God. Is when he was leading one tribe tribe of Judah for seven months for seven years and six months and for seven years he was faithful with one tribe this great king anointed by God but is only managing one tribe for seven years and after seven and a half years God saw his faithfulness God saw that he didn't use it as an excuse or compare himself to other kings who had more. God saw that he grew and he became stronger with that one tribe. He didn't say, God, why did you let me go through all of this and only you gave me one tribe? God, I deserve more. Saul got all 12 tribes on the day of his anointing and I didn't get nothing. I fought and I, I wrestled and I finally got the breakthrough and it came in the form of one tribe. God, I'm offended. David never did that. He had one tribe. He managed that tribe. He worked with that tribe. He, 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 he grew that tribe. He became stronger. The house of David became stronger and stronger. The house of Saul became weaker and weaker. And then came a point after seven and a half years of managing one tribe that God said, David, I'm going to give you 12 tribes now. 
God's anointing will begin a process in your life where God will give you in small nuggets of the things He promised to you. Some people get everything but watch those people. Those things they get never last because they didn't stretch they didn't grow their mind didn't shift their lifestyle their systems their structure wasn't developed to maintain what God gave them it came in it ripped everything apart and two years later everything is back where it used to be but what God does with David and he will do that with you and he will do that with me is that he first makes you who you are you begin to serve you begin to be faithful and finally he gives you a breakthrough just the tribe of Judah and instead of comparing yourself to another pastor, instead of comparing yourself to another person, instead of complaining and saying, God, but I fought so much, I deserve more. God, when is my harvest going to come? Listen, work the tribe of Judah for seven and a half years. Work the tribe of Judah for the seven and a half years. And there is God's timing where God will measure all the rest of the 11 tribes. And in one day, He will not add tribes by years. He'll add them all at once. Acceleration will take place. When Jesus came on this earth, He was announced to be a son of God by God at the River Jordan. Later on, He got announced to be a son of God by the church. You know that Jesus is still waiting to be announced as a son of God by the world. Jesus only got one tribe. He's still waiting for the 11 tribes. He's still waiting for the fullness where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Even Jesus is still waiting for his full inheritance. If you are in that place right now where you have not gotten that one tribe, I want to tell you something. I want to encourage you today to activate yourself in the Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you today to pray for the sick. I want to encourage you today to witness to people. I want to encourage you today the anointing that you got whenever you got it is laying dormant until you stop being lazy and stop waiting for God to move. You move and God will follow. We are not in the Moses time where Moses waited, the Red Sea split and then Moses went in. We are in the Joshua time where Joshua stepped in and God split the Jordan. We are in a time where God says these signs will follow. We don't follow the signs that are behind us. Meaning we take a step, God takes a step. You pray for the sick, God says I will heal. You witness to somebody, God says I will save them. You will pray for somebody's freedom, God says I will deliver them. You move, move. Don't wait for a microphone. Don't wait for somebody to give you a recommendation. Don't wait for somebody to open the door for you. You go and open that door yourself. You go find a place to serve. Not a place to shine, but a place to serve. And when God measures you, a next step. And you will notice that. People will notice that. Where things will shift in your life. Things will shift in your family. Things will shift in your tiny ministry. And there will be that one tribe. Don't ever be a man who took one talent, remember in the, in the New Testament? And what did he did with that talent? With a bad attitude. He buried it. He says, what's the use of this if it's not 12? He buried it and God came back to him and he says, you lazy and you wicked servant. If God is using you in words of knowledge that only heals people's back, never be embarrassed of that. Make sure everybody's back is healed. If God uses you to witness to people in the way that He gives you prophetic words about their destiny and you see somebody who's doing a crusade and thousands come in, make sure you use that one talent and one tribe until God Himself measures another level of the grace in your life. Never compare, never complain and never grumble about what God has entrusted you with because that snotty, spoiled brat attitude kills the flow of God's grace and it stops the timing of God to bring a change in our life. I just decree and declare that it's going to be an acceleration at God's time. But until then, work your tribe. Work your talent. If you got those 20 people, pastor, make sure that those 20 people are the best 20 people. Make sure that you're doing today what you would do if you would have a thousand people. You pray today like you would pray when you would have a thousand people. You fast today like you would fast as if you would have a thousand people. You today smile, you today preach like you would have a thousand people. Now make sure you don't spend your money like you would have a thousand people because you'd be broke. But everything else, you develop your spirit as saying, God, your anointing rests upon my life. 
I am not going to be offended if I don't have a place to shine. I'll look for a place to serve. And God, if you entrust me with one shrine, I promise one thing. I'll never stop being hungry. I'll never stop being holy. And I'll never stop being humble. My head is not going to blow up in pride. My heart is not going to get big in offense. And if somebody doesn't treat me right, if somebody talks about me, if somebody has their expert opinion about me, I am not going to let that get into my head or into my heart. I'm going to be the same man when I had nothing. And I only had you, God. I'm going to be the same man. And God, you can count on that. When God sees that. He will bless you. I want us to rise to our feet. Thank you for watching this content. I hope this was a blessing to you. If you're like me and you like to click on things, click on this, subscribe to our channel, and the content will come to you every time we post it. And remember, the best is yet to come.